אני מתכבד להזמין את פרופסור חמוטל סלובין מאוניברסיטת בר אילן, שהייתה תלמידה ומתמחה במעבד אוטו של עמירם. חמוטל, שהייתה מאותה עת במחלקה ל... שנקרא אז לא נוירוביולוגיה במכון ויצמן למדע, תדבר על top down and extra retinal influences in the visual cortex, revealed by voltage sensitive dye imaging in behaving monkeys, וכמובן שוולטג' סנסיטיב דייס זה היה אחת מפריצות הדרך של עמירם. עמירם. וחמוטל תספר לנו על התקופה הזו ועל חידושים בתחום. תודה רבה. אז ראשית באמת מעמד מרגש. אני רציתי קודם כל להודות לידין דודאי, פרופסור ידין דודאי, וגם לאקדמיה הישראלית למדעים. לא שומעים? אני אשתדל, עכשיו שומעים יותר טוב? כן. מצוין. אז אני רוצה להודות לפרופסור ידין דודאי ולאקדמיה הישראלית למדעים על ארגון יום העיון לזכרו של פרופסור אמירם גרינוולד, וברשותכם את הכמה דקות הקרובות אני ארצה להקדיש לזכרו של אמירם ואני אנסה לחלוק איתכם זווית מבט ייחודית שלי את חוויית המחקר במעבדה של אמירם כמדענית צעירה וחוקרת מתחילה, הייתי פוסט-דוקית במעבדה של עמירם. בנקודת זמן ההיא, סוף שנות התשעים, תחילת שנות האלפיים, של תחילת, תחילת המאה הנוכחית, הגענו למעשה חבורה של פוסט-דוקים למעבדה של עמירם, והגענו ממקומות מאוד שונים, חלק הגיעו מאירופה, מצרפת, מגרמניה, איטליה. חלק הגיעו מארצות הברית, אני הגעתי מהארץ וכולנו הגענו צמאים ונלהבים למעבדה, הגענו ממש בשביל ללמוד את רזי המדע, את הנוהר ובמיוחד במיוחד הגענו בשביל ללמוד אודות אופטיקל אימג'ינג שזה למעשה היה תחום ההתמחות העולמי למעשה של אמירם אז בשלב הזה אמירם כבר פרסם עבודות חשובות על אופטיקל אימג'ינג אופן שווינזק סיגנל, זה למי שלא מכיר, זה למעשה זאת מתודולוגיה שמה שהיא עושה, היא מסתכלת על היחס בין אוקסיומוגלובין לדה אוקסיומוגלובין בתוך המוח, יש קשר ישיר בין הפעילות העצבית במוח לבין עלייה בריכוז הדה אוקסיומוגלובין, ולשיטה הזאת למעשה יש בנפיט אחד מאוד גדול, שיש לה רזולוציה מרחבית מאוד גדולה, ואז כתוצאה מכך אתה ממש יכול לגלות את המיפוי המרחבי של עמודות בתוך אזורים שונים ואמירם בשלבים האלה כבר פרסם עבודות מאוד, משפ... מאוד משפיעות שהיו ממש בחוד החנית של המדע והשיטה הזאת מהר מאוד נכנסה ויושמה בהרבה מעבדות בעזרתו של אמירם. ההנחת האפס אז וגם היום הייתה שלמעשה המוח עובד ברשתות, בעמודות קורטיקליות. שגודלן הוא סדר גודל של כמה מאות מיקרומטרים. והנחת האפס הייתה שבשביל שאנחנו נצליח להבין איך המוח למעשה עובד, אנחנו צריכים שיטה שתאפשר למדוד סיגנלים מהמוח ברזולוציה גבוהה, גם בזמן וגם במרחב, בו זמנית ביחד, ותשקף ממש את הפעילות העצבית בצורה ישירה. ולמעשה השיטה הזאת אז כמובן לא הייתה קיימת ואמירם יחד עם שותפתו החשובה למחקר אז רינה הילדסייב שהייתה כימאית במעבדה הם למעשה שניהם שקדו על פיתוח של צבעים תלויי מתח והצבעים הללו נתנו לגמרי את המענה לדרישה הזאת שהייתה מכיוון שהם אפשרו למעשה מדידה ברזולוציה גבוהה גם בזמן וגם במרחב של הפעילות העצבית ממש באופן ישיר ולא רק של הפעילות העצבית נניח רק הספייקינג אקטיביטי או רק הסופר טרשולד אקטיביטי אלא למעשה גם את הסאב טרשולד וגם את הסופר טרשולד אקטיביטי. זה הרקע ואנחנו נוחתים בדיוק בדיוק לנקודה הזאת, לנקודה הזאת שבה מתרחשת פריצת הדרך של, של אמירם והשתלמנו למעבדה בדיוק בנקודה הזאת וכפי שאתם אולי יכולים לדמיין חלקכם המחקר במעבדה בשלב הזה התנהל בסקרנות רבה, בהתלהבות מאוד גדולה, בעבודה אינטנסיבית סביב השעון, 
אני אתן לכם דוגמה, אחד החברים שלי, הפוסט-דוקים שם, דירק ג'אנק, סיפר לי שהוא הגיע בלילה למשמרת לילה, זה היה מאוד מקובל, עבדנו עד נניח אחרי, אחרי הצהריים, אחרי הצהריים הלכנו להיות קצת עם המשפחות וחזרנו למשמרת נוספת בשעה תשע בלילה עד ארבע לפנות בוקר. ועשינו את זה בכיף גדול, אז הוא באחד בלילה, דירק ג'אנק, באחד בלילה מסתובב במעבדה, עמירם פוגש אותו, ואומר לו, תגיד, איפה כל האחרים? דוגמה קלאסית, דוגמה קלאסית לאמירם. אז בתקופה הזאת שעבדנו במעבדה הרגשנו שיש אתגר גדול לפנינו ושאנחנו למעשה מצליחים לממש אותו, זה אתגר גדול שיש בצידו שכר והשכר הוא הגילוי המדעי. אז אמירם היה ממש השראה בשבילנו, אז התחושה הייתה תחושה של מימוש האתגר, כיבוש יעדים והאווירה הזאת למעשה סחפה את כולנו במעבדה, אני חושבת שזה ממש זכות להימצא במקום כזה, וזה השפיע עלינו בצורה די, די עמוקה בהמשך. תפקידי בכוח היה, דרך אגב, לקחת את הנושא של וולטד סנסיטיב די אימג'ינג וליישם אותו למעשה בקופים מתנהגים, אתם תכף תשמעו על זה. אז אמירם היה עבורנו לא רק מדען פורץ דרך וחלוץ בדרכו, אלא גם מורה לנבחי המדע. והטכנולוגיה. והעובדה היא שכל אחד מחבורת הפוסט-דוקים הזאת באותה תקופה הקים מעבדה שלמעשה התבססה על הכלים שאמירם פיתח, על כלי האופטיקל אימג'ינג, מידע כאלף עדים, אני חושבת, על חוזקת המחקר של אמירם ועל עוצמת ההשפעה המדעית שלו. אז החבורה הזאת כללה למשל את דיר ג'אנקה שהיום הוא חוקר באוניברסיטת רור בבוכום, פרידריק שוון שהוא חוקר היום ב-CNRS במרסה בצרפת ואיתו איבו ונצטה, אייל זיינמן שהוא חוקר היום באוניברסיטת טקסס ביוסטון ואנוכי שנמצאת כאן בארץ חוקרת במרכז החקר המוח באוניברסיטת בר אילן. ושלושה משפטים אחרונים, טרם הגיעי לכאן התכתבתי עם חבורת, הפוס, עם חבורת הפוסט-דוקים ממכון ויצמן, שעד היום אנחנו בקשר, והם כולם ביקשו לציין, ערן והמשפחה, עד כמה הם מוקירים את אמירם, את פועלו ותרומתו החשובה והשפעתו המכרעת על הקריירה המדעית והאישית של כל אחד מהם. ובמעבדות שלנו אנחנו עכשיו מגדלים את דור ההמשך ומקווים שפועלו של אמירם ימשיך להדהד במדע ואיתנו לעוד הרבה זמן. אז בשלב הזה אני אפנה בעצם להרצאה באנגלית, וכמו שידין אמר, אני אעבור לאנגלית. So, uh, the topic I will uh, present today is um, on voltage sensitive dye imaging in behaving monkeys. So clearly uh, this tool was developed during my postdoc in uh, Amiram's lab, and I'm going to discuss today top down and extra retinal influences in the visual cortex. And this is uh, quite a different view because the visual cortex is, uh, was considered to be mainly a feature detector. So I'll start with asking what are the tasks of the visual system. So natural images are comprised from key features, surfaces and contours. And surfaces can be um, luminous surfaces, namely black and white, or with different colors. And contours actually define the border of objects. So in order to process and interpret the information in images, the visual system needs to detect the contour and surfaces and combine them to create coherent objects. So for example, over here, the visual system needs to detect the contour of this tube and also the contour of this color splash, and then uh, combine the, the colored surfaces, the silver surface and the red surface, the, surf, uh, the red surface together with the contour in order to generate the perception and the recognition of a color tube. The next logical step or is, once an object is actually generated, is to segregate it from the background, a process that we call figure ground segregation. And this process can be quite straightforward, but it can be also quite challenging. For example, if we look in this picture, it's very difficult to notice that there is actually an all over here. Uh, but once this animal actually turns its eyes towards us and we can visualize the eyes and the face, we can start to do this, this process of figure ground segregation, although it is still quite challenging in this case. Um, the next logical step uh, in the task of the visual system is um, to segregate not only between one object and the background, but also between different objects. So this is what we call figure-figure segregation. So for example, in, uh, in this image over here, the visual system needs to segregate not only between this animal and the background, but also between the different animals. So visual stimuli or uh, 
stimulus characteristics that uh, belong to one object will not be mixed with the, with the uh, stimulus characteristic of the object nearby. Now, it was suggested that um, uh, such processes are being done in the cortical visual system. So here's a, a quick reminder about the visual pathway to the primary um, visual cortex. So light that is coming from an outside object is traveling through the lenses in the eye, and then, they, and then the light lands at the back of the eyeball on the retina where it activates photoreceptors and later on retinal ganglion cells that sends their output to the next station in the brain, which is the lateral geniculate nucleus right here. And from here, information is traveling through the optic radiation, arriving to the occipital lobe and landing in the primary visual cortex, this is the first cortical station of the visual input that is coming from the retina. Now, um, if we look into the primary visual cortex, which is located over here, um, we can see that this bottom-up information arriving from uh, the retina in a very hierarchical manner through feed-forward connection can actually explain many of V1 neurons' characteristics. Uh, for example, it can explain the projection of the visual field into V1, the retinotopic map. It can explain the sensitivity of the neurons over there to contrast. Um, um, tuning curve to orientation, selectivity to the right eye or left eye, um, responses, different responses to color, spatial frequency, and so on and so forth. And this was actually a term that was defined many years ago by Hubel and Weasel as feature detector. Uh, however, if we look into the visual cortex, and this is a, a side view of the monkey's visual cortex, which is a very uh, similar model to the human uh, visual system, uh, we can see that there are actually many uh, visual areas. There are about 30 different visual areas. This is the unfold cortical uh, region. And uh, once again, if we look into the system, we see that the beginning of the system is structured like, uh, like a hierarchical uh, model, but then um, there is lots of connectivity between the different visual areas, uh, which reflect both feedforward and feedback connection. So it turns out that feedforward and feedback connections are key features in cortical organization. And feedforward connections, which over here are denoted by the blue arrows, um, uh, defined a connection between lower areas to higher areas. So for example, from V1 to V2. Now, it seems that cortical region connected by feedforward pathway are also connected by equal or even greater density of feedback connections. And you can see the feedback connection over here with the uh, red arrows. So feedback connection connect higher order areas to lower uh, regions. So for example, V2 project to V1, but also area IT, which deals with uh, phase recognition and complex uh, a complex object processing, it's also project to uh, V1. And it turns out that actually two cortical regions separated by a single hierarchy are often reciprocally connected with feedforward and feedback connections. And even more, feedback are more numerous than feedforward uh, pathways, suggesting that they make an essential contribution to cortical function. So what we hypothesize is that understanding the interplay of feedforward and feedback signaling is key to understanding the uh, neurocortical function. So the outlines of my talk today, I will focus on um, uh, mainly feedback connection, so I'm going to speak about figure, uh, figure ground segregation and several additional complex uh, tasks that we train the animals on. And then I'm going to speak about evidence for extra retinal input in, in, in V1, which, which is again very different from the view of feature detector. So um, we are using voltage sensitive, we're using long-term voltage sensitive dye imaging in our animals. So here's an optical chamber in one of our animals where we can see several visual areas, the primary visual, uh, the primary visual cortex, secondary visual cortex, and area before. And now we can stain this cortex with uh, the blue dyes that were um, developed by Amiram Greenwald and Rena Hildesheim. These are small organic molecules that penetrate into the cellular membrane of neurons, and these molecules um, acts like transducers, uh, transducing changes in memory potential into changes in fluorescence. 
So the voltage-sensitive dye signal that uh, we measure in vivo uh, from each pixel uh, is actually a population response. It is the weighted sum of melbourne potential from all neuronal elements in the upper layers, layers 4, 2, 3, and 1. It emphasizes subthreshold activity but reflects also supra-threshold activity. And importantly, this technique, as opposed to uh, optical imaging of a music signal has uh, both high spatial, by spatial I refer to the mesoscale, and temporal resolution. So uh, here we trained uh, uh, the animal simply to, to fixate on this uh, very small fixation point, and we presented the animal with very simple geometric contour that you can see over here. And um, these uh, stimuli were presented at the fovea, which is the location in the retina with the highest acuity, the highest spatial resolution in terms of visual processing. And um, what we can see over here are the voltage sensitive dye map at the peak response. Uh, that were evoked by these geometric shapes. And these geometric shapes are very small, they are smaller than one degree. And interestingly, what you can see is that the circle uh, generates sort of like an elliptical shape activity uh, in V1. Uh, just to explain that the hot color is standing for depolarization or increased membrane potential, and uh, the blue colors are standing for no response in this case, baseline response, if you wish. Um, if we look into the triangle, we can see that this corner appears over here, the two edges of the triangle appears over here, and over here we can see the bases of the triangle. If we look into the square, so let's, let's move over the, over the corner, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, and if we go over the cortex, this is one, this is two, this is the third corner, and this is the fourth corner. So we can really see here a very nice topographic code for uh, simple geometric shapes. But what happens for more complex um, contours? What happens for um, illusionary contours? Uh, and what happens when we embed them in a, in a noisy uh, background? So uh, we decided to study the figure ground segregation uh, using contour integration. This is a, this is a, a, a paper that we published uh, several uh, years ago. And uh, in, in this process, uh, similarly oriented a discrete Gabor element, which you can see over here, uh, that have similar orientation, are perceptually grouped together. And by perceptually grouped, I mean that there's no physical connection between these individual Gabor. Nevertheless, you still visualize here a circular contour. And it's a very fast and effective process. Uh, it obeys the uh, good continuation law of the Gestalt. And interestingly, if you take this circular contour and you embed this in a noisy background of randomly oriented end position Gabor, interestingly enough, you can see that these elements still bind together. They don't get confused with the other elements of the background. And this leads to the pop out of the circular contour and to figure out segregation of this contour from the noisy background. So the research question that we wanted to ask is how discrete visual elements that are encoded by probably different neuronal assemblies are grouped together to form a coherent contour. And what are the neuronal mechanisms underlying figure from background segregation? And what we did over here, we trained the animals uh, on a contour detection task. So the animal needed to discriminate between a visual stimulus that contained a circular contour, as shown over here, versus um, an image where this uh, circular contour was absent. Uh, just to mention that we actually generated this image from this one simply by randomly rotating the orientation of each of these elements. And then you don't see this circular contour anymore. Um, now let's have a look over here. This is where the animal was actually fixating and this yellow part, which was invisible for the animal, this is only for demonstration, is actually part of the visual field, um, part of the visual stimulus itself that is mapped into our imaging area. And what we can do, we can enlarge this part and see that we see here part of the figure, part of the background, and there are, uh, the figure itself, or the circle itself, is comprised from several Gabor elements, also the background, and we can actually localize these different Gabor elements over the cortex. So this is V1, and over here we can see the circular area, the area that belongs to the uh, circular contour, the area that belongs to the background, and the individual Gabor element. 
And now we let the animal perform the task and we want to understand what's going on in terms of figure gun segregation. So having a look into the very early time, 60 to 80 milliseconds after the onset of the visual stimulus, interestingly, what we can see for both conditions of the contour and non-contour, we can see here the uh, individual Gabor elements appear very clearly in both cases and there's no much difference between these two um, uh, stimuli. However, 60 milliseconds later on, there is a very dramatic change in the voltage sensitive dye signal. And what we see for the contour condition, if we look into the figure area, the circle area, we can see now a continuous enhanced activity where all the Gabor elements actually sort of like group together and a very suppressed activity in the background. And uh, this activity is actually, or this pattern is actually unique to the contour. It does not appear in the non-contour. Indeed, if we look into the background area and we plot it as function of time, um, we, we plot the voltage sensitive dye signal as function of time, we can see that in the contour condition, there is a large suppression relative to the non-contour. So what I suggest that we see here is that at early time, indeed, we see the individual Gabor element, but at later time, we see a more complex visual function, which is the segregation of the figure from the background or the circular contour from the background. And now we can define actually a measure for this figure gun segregation, which is simply the response difference between the circle and the background when comparing the contour and non-contour, and we can compute it as function of time. And this is shown over here, and what it shows you is that shortly after the onset of the visual stimulus, we can see that this figure gun modulation starts to develop, but actually arrives to a maximal value only at late times. So what we are looking here is uh, into the figure gun modulation that appears at late times, which fits well with <coughs> top-down influences or uh, feedback uh, projection into V1. But um, if, if this is the case, then we would expect that this kind of activity would be related to the animal's behavior. <coughs> and so now what we wanted to do is to study the relation between the patterns of the voltage sensitive dye signal and the animal behavior. And to do so, uh, we started to um, change the saliency of the contour. So here's the contour uh, shown over here. And now we can start to jitter it a little bit. So we added uh, a little bit of jitter, 15 degrees jitter, to the circular contour. And I think that you can see that it's already difficult to perceive the circular contour. And then we add more jitter. This is like 25 degrees jitter. It's quite difficult to see here the contour. And this is the non-contour. And what we did now, we ask the animal, what do you see? Do you see a contour or, or, you, or, or, or do you see a non-contour? So we could calculate the psychometric curve based on the behavioral report of the animal, and then we can also calculate the neurometric curve based on the neuronal measure that I just told you about, the difference between the circle and the background. This is the psychometric curve of the animal. This is the probability to detect a contour where, where, when the orientation jitter is zero. This means that the animal viewed a contour. And you can see that the probability to detect a contour is very high. However, as we increase the noise, as the uh, uh, contour itself become less salient, you can see that the uh, probability to detect decreases. What is the difference between the L and the X? Uh, two different monkeys. And, and, and then, uh, so this is the psychometric curve, has been shown also in, in, uh, in humans. And this is the neurometric curve showing the figure ground measure. And very interestingly, once again, we can see that the measure is very high, the figure ground measure is very high for the contour condition where we have a clear circle popping out from the noisy background, but it decreases when we uh, increase the noise, when we increase the orientation jitter. And there is a high correlation between the psychometric and neuromagic curve, which means that the figure gun modulation is related to the contour saliency and to the behavioral report of the animal. So here's a short uh, mid summary. Uh, what we see is that the early phase of the response in V1 encodes individual Gabor feature detector. The late phase shows figure gun segregation and the spatial patterns extended much beyond the, sorry, much beyond the individual Gabor element, as if a sort of like a continuous contour, if you wish, as if, as if the perception was something like that, a continuous salient contour was popping out from the suppressed background. 
And this late modulation was correlated with the monkey's behavioral report and is likely to be mediated by feedback and also with the cooperation of horizontal connection in the primal visual cortex. So what we did next, we uh, started to train the uh, animals on different uh, demanding visual tasks. And interestingly enough, we found that the late response in all of these tasks was correlated with the perceptual report of the animal and revealed spatiotemporal patterns that were actually task dependent. Uh, so for example, we trained the animal on a figure-figure segregation where the animal needed to discriminate between a condition that included two objects versus one object, two figures versus one figure. And um, we also trained the animals to discriminate between face versus non-face. Um, so the animal needed to discriminate between a face stimulus and another stimulus where the local visual features were identical to the face, but there was no face over there. And uh, what we saw in all these very different uh, behavioral tasks is that all of them had this late component. So this is the late component in the figure ground segregation. This is the late component in the figure figure segregation where the animal needs to actually to segregate between different objects. And also in the face versus non-face discrimination, we observed another late component around 200 milliseconds, which was very different from the early component. Um, in all cases, what we found is that the late phase was correlated with the perceptual report of the animal. I already talked about figure gown segregation, but a similar picture emerged for the figure figure segregation. We could compute over here the uh, psychometric curve for discrimination uh, uh, between the saliency of two separated um, uh, bar elements over here until they become actually one uh, object, if you wish. And this was very much correlated with a figure-figure uh, measure that uh, we defined and found in the visual cortex. And for the face versus no, no face discrimination task, we, we found that the late task was correlated uh, with uh, discrimination between correct and error trials. And interestingly enough, if we look into this late phase in V1, we found that uh, it shows very different spatial activation patterns that are task dependent. So in the figure ground, we found enhanced activity in, in the figure itself, in the contour and suppressed activity in the background. Um, in the figure figure, we found that the different object, that the two objects, were actually labeled or encoded by different amplitude. And very interestingly, also in the face versus non-face task, what we found is that the late phase showed uh, an interesting cluster of activity in, in space where the visual features of the face itself, the eyes, the mouth, and the, pear, and the, and, and the mouth itself were mapped to this very late phase. So uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, get to the uh, last point in my talk, and this is evidence for extraretinal input into the primary visual cortex. So when we uh, scan uh, natural images, uh, we usually make very fast eye movement, which are called saccades. And uh, this, is a, a, this is a natural image, for example, where we plotted the uh, eye position of a human observer. And you can see over here that uh, the uh, human observer was uh, fixating in different points while uh, making a saccade from one location to another location. And we benefit from such large saccadic eye movement because we bring into the fovea of, of the retina and also the fovea in the primary visual cortex a region of interest in that image, which enables us then to analyze uh, this location, for example, these faces over here or this dress over here or other parts, uh, so we can actually analyze them with higher spatial resolution. However, this does not come without a cost because it means that each time we make a saccadic eye movement, uh, the image of a retina is uh, actually shifted, but we don't perceive the world as moving, are we? Um, so um, this imposes what we call the visual stability problem. And it was suggested that uh, given the saccadic vectors, namely given the motor information about the saccadic direction and the size, as well as the uh, image that is falling on the fova itself, one can actually reconstruct the visual scene in order to generate this stabilized visual world. 
Uh, but maybe this is a problem only for large saccades. What happens when we do fixation? So here's another natural image, and over here in red we can see the uh, trajectory of the eyes. And let's look into one epoch of fixation, when the subject sort of like holds the eye very, very tight in, in one place in the visual field. And if we enlarge it, we can still see that the subject is doing a small micro saccade, small saccade, which are known as micro saccade. So the same problems holds for micro saccade during fixation. So in terms of the retina level, stationary stimuli simply do not exist. Nevertheless, our perception is stable. And uh, this suggests the existence of an exoretinal input, which can be used by the visual system to correct the motion induced by eye movement. And the question is, at what level of the visual system? And we decided to look for this in the primary visual cortex, and it is referred as extra-retinal input. And what we uh, let the animal do, we let the animal simply fixate on a very small fixation point without any visual stimulus this time on the screen. Only the animal is making fixation with small micro saccade. And then we looked into the voltage sensitive dye signal. And this is a, a, a current ongoing study that was, that was uh, not published yet, but what you can see over here are the voltage sensitive uh, dye maps. So this is the micro saccade onset. Over here you can see the profile of the micro saccade. And following the micro saccade, uh, you can see that there's decrease in activity, which is denoted here by the blue color. So there is a suppression. And later on, there is enhancement activity, increased activity. This is denoted by this um, pink and, and white color. So if we average the activity across V1, what we can see in that example session that I showed you is that there is actually a two-phase modulation in V1 induced by this small micro saccade. Um, and uh, the, the two phases show an initial suppression followed by uh, enhanced activity, again, once again, around 200 milliseconds. So micro saccade induced a biphasic modulation in V1, an early suppression followed by late enhancement. But then we ask, well, uh, in many cases, actually, I mean, in most cases, we make micro saccade and saccade when there's a visual stimulus in the world. So do they coexist? What happens actually when the animal is making saccades or micro saccades in the presence of a visual stimulus? So in this case, uh, the animal was fixating over here and it was presented with a very small visual stimulus and let's see what is happening. The, uh, uh, the video uh, follows with um, um, explanations. So this is a micro saccadic modulation in V1 during visual stimulus presentation. This is the imaged area. Over here we see the eye position. Over here we see the response to the visual stimulus, that one. And then the animal makes a small micro saccade. And interestingly, you can see that the activity is actually shifting over the visual cortex to a new location. Now without poses, the activity, micro saccade, and it shifts. So in terms of the primary visual cortex, things are completely instable. Everything is moving around. And what we were wondering is, uh, what about this exoretinal input? Does it coexist with this uh, modulation of micro saccade in the presence of the visual stimulus? So uh, this is the same single trial that I showed you in, in the movie. And over here, we can define um, two uh, different sites, the site that we call the stimulus site and then the landing site. This is where the, stim the visual stimulus actually was evoked, and this is the landing site where the visual stimulus appeared after the micro saccade. And then we looked in other parts of V1 that were not visually stimulated. And interestingly enough, what we found is that um, if we look into uh, these two sites, the stimulated site and the landing site, we can see that following the micro saccade, there's decreased activity in the stimulation site, increased activity in the landing site. This is expected, right, because the world is shifting all the time in the primary visual cortex. But if we look over here in the non-stimulated site, we can see the exoretinal uh, input over here. And if we compare it to the blank trials where the animals did not see any visual stimulus, they are very much comparable. So the exoretinal input coexists with the micro, micro saccade effect due to stimulus shift over the retina. So let me summarize at this point. Um, 
The early phase of response in V1 encodes basic stimulus features as was shown and reported many times by uh, many uh, uh, different labs and papers. But the late phase of response encodes more complex visual processing, for example, figure gun segregation, segregation between two figures, attentional effect, face recognition, and extra retinal input. And by extra retinal input, I refer to probably a copy of the efferents or proprioceptive copy of the eye motion. And uh, top-down influences mediated through feedback connections are likely to be involved in this late phase. And so uh, V1 encodes higher visual function in addition to the feature, uh, in addition to uh, the basic feature uh, encoding in a task-dependent manner, and also motor-related information about microsaccades and saccade. And I'd like to thank, uh, of course, Amira, um, and uh, our lab members, and specifically previous lab members who have done this work. Ariel uh, Gilad has his position now in the medical school in Jerusalem, and Yardena Div and Toma Buchnik who are now uh, students in the lab. So thank you. תודה רבה, חמוטל. אם יש שאלה, מישה, בבקשה. These microsaccades that you study, are they really driven by the motor system or they could be just the noise in the eye position? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, I think it was something like 10 years ago, Uh, there was a work published in Science showing that the superior colliculus was generating the uh, motor planning for also microsaccades. So, so uh, for many years, people thought that actually microsaccades are sort of like a noise of the system. But then um, clear motor activity in the superior colliculus was shown uh, to actually to predict the microsaccade generation. So this is part of the um, job of the superior colliculus. תודה רבה לחמוטל, פרופסור חמוטל סלובין.